Hey, what's going on, gang? This is Nate on the Stone. Welcome back to my channel. And this week, we are looking at the push for re-education here in the U.S. and why it's a threat to everyone. We have talked before here on the Stone about James O'Keefe and his group, Project Veritas. They go undercover to get stories that the mainstream media would rather ignore. Last year, if you remember, for example, they revealed the outright bias that Facebook and Google had towards conservatives and basically anyone who leans right of center. Well, this past week, they did it again, infiltrating Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign in Iowa, revealing that the campaign of an openly admitted socialist is populated with actual socialists. I'm shocked, shocked. In the video that was subsequently dropped to Twitter, Kyle Jurek, a campaign organizer for Bernie Sanders' campaign in Iowa, said that the U.S. needed to have established gulags so that people could be re-educated to not be Nazis. He went on to say that Stalin's gulags in the USSR, pff, they weren't so bad, they paid people a living wage and allowed conjugal visits, don't you know? And that part of the reason why Bernie Sanders is pushing for free education from preschool through senior year of college is specifically so that people can be re-educated. Don't believe me? Here's Kyle Jurek himself. Do you even think that some of these, like, mega people could even be re-educated? <laughs> I mean, we gotta try. I mean, like, so, like, in Nazi Germany, after the fall of the Nazi party, there was a shit ton of the populace that was f***ing Nazified. And, like, Germany had to spend billions of dollars re-educating f***ing people to not be Nazis. Like, we're probably gonna have to do the same f***ing thing here. And that's kind of what Bernie's like, whole f***ing, like, hey, free education for everybody, because we're gonna have to teach you not to be a f***ing Nazi. There's a reason Joseph Stalin had gulags, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, gulags were a lot better than, like, what, like, the CIA has told us that they were. Like, people were actually paid a living wage in gulags. They had conjugal visits in gulags. Gulags were actually meant for, like, re-education. Now, of course, some people are saying that Project Veritas is just selectively editing the footage that they got when they infiltrated Bernie's campaign, which is an old charge, but it's a charge, too, that has never actually held water. And when 11 campaign staffers for Sanders respond to this sting operation by locking their Twitter accounts, it definitely reinforces the idea that it's the staffers who were caught with their hands in the cookie jar. After all, if nothing really bad was being said, there wouldn't be any reason to lock these accounts. It would make much more sense to just come forward and prove that O'Keefe and his people were selectively editing, i.e. lying, about this whole thing, thereby getting him out of the collective progressive hairpiece altogether once and for all. Now, before we go on to talk about re-education, we have to address the red elephant in the room, which is the gulag. When Kyle Jurek called for gulags to be established here in the U.S., what he was calling for was the establishment of a barbaric penal system which was exploited by the USSR for 20th century slave labor. The gulag, in Russian, Glavno Upravleni Lagari, was, as its name implied, a prison system where the prisoners were used for slave labor. The gulag system was officially created in 1919, after the Bolshevik Revolution, and by 1921 there were 84 gulag camps in the newly created Soviet Union. But it wasn't until the reign of Joseph Stalin, 1929-1953, that the gulag system was truly exploited for slave labor. To give just one example, the White Sea Baltic Canal, the 141 mile link between the White Sea in the Arctic and the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe, which opened August of 1933 and which was built completely from slave labor culled from the Gulag system. Men and women prisoners, Zeks in Russian, who were composed of common criminals, political enemies of the state, and kulaks, prosperous peasants who had revolted against collectivization, were forced to work 14 hours a day with simple tools and no safety equipment. Rations were meager, and if you did not complete your work quota for the day, you were punished by receiving even less food than usual. Because of the forced hard labor, the small rations, and the cruelty of the Russian winter, 
thousands of people died in the Gulag system. In the 14 months that it took to build the White Sea Baltic Canal, between 100 and 200,000 people died. Many of these people died from overexhaustion. They were literally worked to death. Nathalie Frankel, the chief manager of construction for the Gulag, and the man whom Alexander Solzhenitsyn named the Demon of the Archipelago, said in a secret communication, quote, We have to take everything from the prisoner in the first three months. After that, we don't need him anymore. And some people were simply executed, shot, such as Ukrainian general Yuri Tayutiyunik and Russian theologian and philosopher Pavel Florensky, since they were deemed too dangerous to live by the communist authorities. In total, it's been estimated that 20 million people were killed during Stalin's regime from 1929 to 1953, with 1 1.5 million people being killed specifically in the Gulag system. So contrary to what Kyle Jurek and his buddies think, the Gulags were not primarily centers of re-education where people were trained to be good communist comrades, no. They were centers of slave labor. Re-education actually only came later as justification for the slave labor. Quote, Soon an ideological justification emerged, reforging prisoners, supposedly a form of rehabilitation. Reforging or rehabilitating could yield medals and honors or even an increase in food. It could raise a prisoner's position in the gulag hierarchy or secure his early release. Now, I wish I could say that Kyle Jurek and all of his comrades are just flukes in society, but it's entirely possible that they believe that gulags and re-education should be made the norm here in America because they are genuinely ignorant about USSR history and what the gulags were actually for. And the scary thing about that is that it leads us down a very dark train of logic. If Kyle Jurek and his friends are genuinely ignorant, then that means they're ignorant because they were never taught USSR history. And they were never taught USSR history because the public education system never taught them. And the American public education system did not teach them because, by and large, the American public education system is sympathetic to the views that Kyle Jurek and his friends expressed to Project Veritas. We've known for a while that college professors tend to lean towards the left, with a 2018 study finding, for example, that liberal college professors outnumber conservative college professors by a ratio of 10.4 to 1. But now this trend is being seen throughout public education as a whole, K through 12. A national survey conducted by the Education Week Research Center in 2017 found, for example, quote, 43% of the educators surveyed see themselves as moderate. The rest were slightly more likely to lean to the left than the right. Nearly 30% described themselves as liberal or very liberal, while only 27% saw themselves as conservative or very conservative. What's more, while 50% of the teachers surveyed voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, only 29% of those surveyed voted for Donald Trump. And this leaning to the left is not only becoming the norm in public education, but it is actually becoming more pronounced, with the biggest sign of this being the Red for Ed campaign. Now, the Red for Ed campaign was created in March of 2018 by Noah Carvelis, who is a 24-year-old public school teacher from Arizona. And the campaign is composed of teacher union members from across the country. Now, ostensibly, the Red for Ed campaign exists for purely academic reasons. Higher teacher pay, better education environments for students, etc., etc. But its real goals are all political. And wouldn't you know it, all of those political goals lean hardcore to the left. A brief browsing through the National Education Association's website shows that they oppose things such as the A through F grading system, arming teachers so that they can actually protect their classes from would-be shooters, dress codes because they supposedly discriminate against minority students, and privatizing education, i.e giving parents more choices as to where they're actually going to send their kids to school. But that's not all. The website also boasts that it helped flip Virginia's legislature blue last year in 2019, the same legislature that is now going along with Governor Northam's plan to curtail the Second Amendment. 
and it celebrates the Supreme Court upholding a Pennsylvania school district's decision to allow students to use the bathroom based on their gender identity instead of their actual biology and celebrating a federal judge's ruling in Virginia who said that a school district had actually violated a trans student's rights when they forced her to use the girls' bathroom instead of the boys' bathroom like she wanted. It's not surprising then that Noah Carvelis, the founder of the Red for Ed campaign, said at the Socialism 2018 conference in Chicago, yes, we do live in a world where that's a thing, quote, we built a new political power in Arizona and it's taking control right now of the future of the state. We have to build our own political power. We have to build our own organization. We have to stay true to our values. They have to be democratic. It's not surprising either that the most common occupation for Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign's fourth quarter donors was teacher. What is even more terrifying though than the Red for Ed's support for these ideological policies is that it and the teachers who comprise it believe, as does Kyle Jurek, that re-education has to be made an actual part of the American landscape. Education Minnesota, the 80,000 member strong teachers union for that state, sent out this announcement for their three-day 2020-2021 Education Minnesota Unity Summit, saying, quote, Education Minnesota reshaped its election work in 2018, focusing on getting out the vote at the work site level. While the union still supported pro-public education candidates, the focus on activism and building power at the work site was the core of our electoral success. As we look to 2020, voting is still a high priority. And through our democracy, and especially our union, we have the collective power to defeat Trumpism in 2020 and win a public education system in 2021 that can prevent Trumpism for the next generation. Not only is it blatantly political, but it is also blatantly a call for re-education. How else can we describe a call to action that promises collective power to defeat Trumpism and to prevent its rising again in the next generation unless people, children especially, are taught that things like national sovereignty, assimilation, rule of law, sexual complementarity, biological reality, federalism, etc., etc., are not just wrong and misguided, but are actively evil and Nazi-esque? Because all of those things are, by the left, lumped together under the category of Trumpism. Fuck the patriarchy. Fuck Donald Trump. Fuck Mike Pence. Fuck white supremacy. Fuck racism. Fuck misogyny. Fuck homophobia. Fuck transphobia. Fuck capitalism. Fuck classism. Fuck transphobia. Fuck ableism. Fuck Islamophobia. Fuck anti-Semitism. Fuck every kind of bigotry out there. But it goes even deeper than that because re-education is an attack on the human person himself, regardless of your politics and your policies. Because re-education is the antithesis of genuine education. Education is another word that has, like so many, been abused today. When we talk about education today, we're usually talking about facts, figures, and skills that are useful or at best pragmatic so that the students looking up at their teachers with doe-like eyes, either from naivete, excitement, or just sheer boredom, you make the call, can one day, hopefully after they graduate, become productive members of the economy. Education in this light is just a tool to make good drones for the ain't-like colony that we call society today. And even when reasons are expanded besides get a good job, the reasons for getting an education remain very narrow. In a 2015 article published on LinkedIn, Mohammed Reda made a list of 10 reasons why you should get an education. A list which included such reasons as a happy life, money, equality, world peace, economic growth. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these reasons by themselves per se, but none of these reasons individually are the primary reasons for getting an education. Heck, all these reasons lumped together are not the primary reason to get an education. The real fundamental core reason why education is so important is because it helps us to become more human. We've talked about the 20th century French philosopher Jacques Maritain before here on the channel, 
primarily when we talked about the common good. Well, Maritain also said that man is unique in the world because man is the only animal who actually has to actively earn his nature. Man has to work to become human. Now, that is not to say that you are not a human person before you get an education and that uneducated people are non-persons. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what Maritain is saying. It simply means that your nature, your humanity, is refined, sharpened, and clarified with a genuine education. And this only makes sense. People are people because of our rational nature, because of the logos that lives within us and that ignites us from the inside. By using the logos, by strengthening it, sharpening it, casting it through a genuine education, we are simply strengthening and utilizing that which makes us human. One of the best off-the-cuff reasons for why we need a genuine education actually comes from John Henry Newman, the 19th century Anglican and later Catholic priest, cardinal, cleric, philosopher, who said, quote, Men whose minds are possessed with one object take exaggerated views of its importance, are feverish in the pursuit of it, make the measure of things which are utterly foreign to it, and are startled and despond if it happens to fail them. They are ever in alarm or in transport. Those, on the other hand, who have no object or principle whatever to hold by, lose their way every step they take. They are thrown out and do not know what to think or say at every fresh juncture. They have no views of persons or occurrences or facts which come suddenly upon them, and they hang upon the opinion of others for want of internal resources. But the intellect which has been disciplined to the perfection of its powers, which knows and thinks while it knows, which has learned to leaven the dense mass of facts and events with the elastic force of reason, such an intellect cannot be partial, cannot be exclusive, cannot be impetuous, cannot be at a loss, cannot be but patient, collected, and majestically calm, because it discerns the end in every beginning, the origin in every end, the law in every interruption, the limit in each delay, because it ever knows where it stands and how its path lies from one point to another. In other words, a man with an education doesn't only just rely on things like history, literature, philosophy, theology, math, and science to understand the world around him, but can also rely on his reason to know where he stands and what is going on in the world around him. He's not reliant on opinion mobs or demagogues, nor is he bound to an ideological view that, if it collapses, causes his own understanding of the world to collapse with it. He is, in a word, self-reliant and independent. But what this means is that education must be concerned with teaching people how to think through the different fields of study. Things like history and literature and science and math and philosophy and theology. Which then means, of course, that the different facts presented in these different fields must be true. You can't teach people how to think historically when history has been rewritten to serve an ideological purpose rather than an educational one. <coughs> 1619 Project! <coughs> and that's why re-education, regardless of who does it, is wrong. In teaching people what to think instead of how to think, by forcing an agenda onto them, you take away one of their primary ways of sharpening their own humanity. Which honestly is the end goal of anyone who says that a population needs to be re-educated, or that a segment of people need to be re-educated. Their goal is to take away an element of your humanity. And honestly, this preventing you from developing your own humanity, that's the end goal of anyone who says that people need to be re-educated, or a certain segment of the population needs to be re-educated. Their ultimate goal is to deprive you of the means of sharpening your own humanity. Because people like that are just easier to control. Re-education, it's not about making people less like Nazis. It's all about making people more like ants. But what say you? What are some ways that we can actually bring genuine education back into social circulation?
As always, let me know your thoughts, ideas, and opinions in the comment section below. Well, that about wraps up everything for right now, gang. As always, if you liked the video, whether you agreed with me or not, don't forget to show your support by giving it a like, leaving a comment, and sharing it on social media with your friends. And if you like videos about the culture, politics, and religion, but from a different POV, then think about subscribing to the channel and ringing the bell for notifications so that you'll always know when I add new videos just like this every Tuesday. Videos you're not going to want to miss. As always, thank you for watching, for giving me a little bit of your day. Thank you to everyone who has already subscribed to my channel. And I will see you all again here next week, gang, on Top of the Stone. Ciao.